Yesterday, we were very blessed in hearing addresses on missions and evangelism. We especially were challenged by God through his word last night that those of us who have not closed with Christ may come to the Redeemer, may put our faith and trust in him, may repent of our sin and be found in Christ with our sins forgiven. What a blessing it was to hear the gospel once again. And I pray and I hope that many of you who have had an impenitent heart have found the Holy Spirit to shatter that heart of stone and given you a heart of flesh. We have prayed fervently for that. Many of us have. I'm also encouraged to hear our brother give us an address on the mission work in Sri Lanka as they seek to bring the light of the gospel to people in a very dark place, spiritually speaking. We heard another message about the Spirit's leading in missions, that men might ascertain whether they are called to go out into the deepest and darkest places of the world. But what is the telos, what is the end of all of that endeavor, of all of that work? Is it to merely see souls saved out of hell, that they would just go and escape the, the place of wrath. Sometimes we think of evangelism in that way and missions in that way. And it is very true that we have a burning desire to see souls saved. We weep and mourn, as the Savior did over Jerusalem, that souls are perishing. But what is the end of the saved soul? It is to worship God. It is to worship God, and so it seems fitting, not by my design, but through the organization of the conference this year, that a message on worship comes at the very end here, after we have been exhorted and challenged in our souls to see the beauty even, as our other brother preached from Psalm 27, to see this one thing we ought to desire is to gaze at the beauty of the Lord and to be found in his house, worshiping him. So we come to this text, and we find that the seeking God who seeks out souls to be saved by sending his spirit into the world, this seeking God says he is seeking something else, that the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. The God who seeks sinners is seeking that those sinners will worship him in spirit and in truth. It's right here plainly in the text. A contemporary minister put it so well memorably in this way. Missions exists because worship does not. And what a wonderful way to remember that in the evangelistic endeavor. And so you find that oftentimes in the evangelistic endeavor, it is merely about punch this card, write your name here, make a decision for the Lord, and have your golden ticket out of hell. No desire to establish worship. But the end is worship. And if you look at the ecclesiastical landscape today, even in even in what are Protestant churches, one is often bewildered and confused. It, there just seems like anything goes. There's a huge variety in what you will find in the worship of God. And when you come into the Reformed Church, it seems as though sometimes well-meaning people will make the doctrine of worship very complicated and very confusing. Truths of God. But we always marvel at the genius of our Lord Jesus Christ, don't we? He is able to take the most complex doctrines, the most profound thoughts, and distill them very simply so that even a child can understand, even a child can know. And he does that here with the doctrine of worship in verse 24. He cuts through all the complexities and through all the clutter of man's words and says very beautifully, God is a spirit. And them that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And what he drills into our minds 
is this truth, that those of us who are to worship God must know what God is first. You must first know what God is before you come to the doctrine of worship because it is derived out of the very nature and being of God. And if you know that God is a spirit, he is not carnal. And so our worship must be spiritual and heavenly, a matter of the soul, first and foremost. The problem for us is as fallen men and women, what? We are carnal. We are carnal in the flesh. This is, very illus- this is illustrated quite well with the Samaritan woman herself. You probably know this well. Christ offers to give her living water. He says, if you drink the water I'm offering to you, you will never thirst, but there will be a wellspring of water in your soul that will spring up into everlasting life. But does she comprehend he is speaking to her spiritually? No. No. She thinks he is speaking of regular drinking water. Verse 15, she says, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. You see, she is thinking that this is water that will just prevent her from coming to the well. She's thinking as a carnal person, not a spiritual one, not thinking of the blessing it would be for the Holy Spirit to be welling up in her soul, leading her to Christ. She was not thinking at that time anyway as a spiritual person ought to think. And the problem with us is that naturally speaking, we are just like her. When the doctrine of worship arises, we do not think as spiritual people. We think as carnal people. We want to gratify our flesh. We want entertainment. We want amusement. You know these things. We want smells and we want bells and we want all manner of things that will tickle our flesh but are of no use in glorifying God or in um, worshiping him from our soul. That is reflected in much carnality, and, you know, they often get the worst reputation, but charismatic churches are obviously a a great, you know, sort of um, uh, target for us when it comes to the doctrine of worship. But let me just say this. Even in our own churches where we believe we get the doctrine of worship right out of the word of God, straight out of scriptures, and I believe we do. You you watched me, witnessed me, um, put my name, uh, affixing it to something that says, I will defend, maintain the doctrine of of purity of worship in this church. I believe these things 100%, and we get the elements of worship right out of the word of God. However, we can go into the worship of God and find that we are not engaging with the worship of God as spiritual people. Where our hearts are not in the worship of God. Where we are carnal even with the right elements of worship. How often have you looked at, say, the bulletin in your church and suddenly your heart starts to race at the title of the sermon? Not because you have a desire in that to worship God, but you simply want uh, an itch scratched. Then you look at maybe the evening service, and you look at the title of it, and you start to yawn. You're not worshiping in spirit and in truth, even if the elements are right. Or maybe you are happy because the presenter gets up here, and he announces we're going to sing to a favorite tune of yours but you have no care or concern to engage with the word of God that we are singing. You miss the heart of the matter, which is to praise God with your heart strings. Real problems we face, for we are often, even in our churches, far too carnal, and it can be a subtle thing, and it needs dealing with. So ultimately, this morning, there's much that could be said, and much will be said, But our time together is more about the nature of God and for our hearts to be spiritually in tune in worshiping him, in worshiping the one who is a most pure spirit, offering spiritual sacrifices to him from the heart by Jesus Christ. And so our theme is the spirituality and simplicity of worship. The spirituality and simplicity of worship, we'll consider that under three heads. First is God is spirit. 
Second is sacrifice is spiritual. And third, worship is simple. And we'll do so if God helps us. First, God is spirit. Now, that truth grounds Christ's discourse on worship completely and utterly. And it eradicates all pretense of complexity and carnality in the worship of God. In our text, you recall Jesus Christ is speaking during a time of great transition in the worship of God from the Old Testament era to the New Testament gospel era of greater liberty and greater spirituality and greater sight of God when forms and shadows of the ceremonial system were being put away as Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of them all and he had come. All the things that had veiled the glory of the Lord in the Old Covenant were being stripped away from worship that we in gospel worship may have a greater sight of God. Now, as Reformed Christians, we are quite familiar with this text, especially verse 24. We say to those who come into our churches, we must worship God in spirit and in truth. That is right. That is absolutely right. It comes out of the word of God. But we can still often miss the fact of where that is rooted. It is rooted in the nature of God. It is first rooted in the nature of God. And if we do not begin there, we miss the fundamental doctrine of worship. That worship must be in accordance with the very nature, the very being of the triune God. After all, who are you worshiping? You must know who you worship and what he is. Hear verse 24 with that understanding. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So Christ first delivers a wondrous lesson on theology proper, doesn't he? God is a spirit, foundational. If you don't understand that, you will not understand worship. Yet how often, when we begin to speak of the doctrine of worship, we actually begin with the regulative principle of worship. Children, in case you don't know what that principle is, I can summarize it like this. It's a principle of worship from the Bible, simply stated. What is not commanded by Scripture is forbidden in the worship of God, and what is commanded must be observed. That's the scriptural principle of worship. We then open up Leviticus 10. We see that Nadab and Abihu offered strange fire, which the Lord says, I commanded them not. We quote Deuteronomy 12.32, What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. We quote Mark 7, saying that Jesus in the New Testament reiterated this, saying, In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men. Rightly so, then, we say that the regulative principle of worship is taught under the second commandment. All these things are right and proper and true and are God-glorifying. But there is something fundamental under the regulative principle and under the second commandment itself, which is the nature of the object of our worship. The problem is carnal man thinks of God as something like himself. We think of him as maybe the pagans thought of Zeus, maybe a, a, a better version of us. We think of making God into our image. Why, we have a famous painting in a papist chapel which shows God something like that. And many unbelievers, when they think of God, they think of that papist painting. And then they think of the triune God. Thanks to the papacy, they think of something that is carnal. But God cannot be painted at all. Jesus reminds us God is a spirit. He is not like us. He is completely other. He is a spirit. And even in the realm of spiritual beings, children think of angels. Even in that realm, he stands above and beyond. Our confession, citing our text, says that God is a most pure spirit. A most pure spirit. He is a spirit unlike any other. Not just one of many. He is for instance, self-existent. He is Jehovah. I am that I am. How utterly unlike the angels, right? The angels were created. Once they were not, then they were. God is the creator being uncreated himself. He is eternal, not having a beginning, unlike the angels, which do. 
God is pure act. He does not change. He has no potential to change. Angels, when they were created, had the potential to fall into sin like Satan did. But God has no potential in that way. I am that I am. He is impassable. We heard a question about impassibility in the Q&A last night. Unlike angels, God is infinite in being and perfection. God is immense. God is incomprehensible. What a glorious thing that is. None of you can fully comprehend what God is. For all eternity, you will be before the presence of the Almighty, and every moment in eternity, or however eternity is ordered, you will grow in awe as you learn more and more about God, and eternity will never exhaust him. God is gloriously and exquisitely simple. His essence is indivisible, no composition to God. His essence is existence, identical, whereas the angels are not simple like God. They once were not, then they were. God is timeless. God does not live in a stream of succession of time. He is above time and not under the stream of time like creatures are. We could go on and on and on. God is a most pure spirit. Nothing can compare to what he is. He is utterly unique in a class infinitely above all. And that is why Scripture scoffs at the gods of the pagans. Who can compare unto thee, O Lord? Who can compare unto thee? And this is a matter of praise and worship, isn't it, friends? When you know of his glory and you know how great he is, truly, as Jesus Christ says, worship begins by knowing him and knowing who he is. Children, This is the God that you worship. This is the God that you worship. Could any painting or image capture him? No. We dare not imagine we could. If we really knew God like this, we would never ever pick up a paintbrush to paint the unpaintable. So after our meditation on God as a most pure spirit, listen to the second commandment afresh, Exodus 20, verses 4 through 5. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and so on. Now, the second commandment is clarified for us in other places. Exodus 32 shows us it's not just about making images of the idols of this world and bowing down to them, but making any representation of the invisible God is forbidden. But so that you're absolutely sure of that, before the second giving of the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy 5, Deuteronomy 4 says, Take ye therefore good heed unto yourselves, for ye saw no matter a, a manner of similitude on the day that the Lord spoke, spake unto you in Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest ye corrupt yourselves and make you a graven image, the similitude of any figure, the likeness of male or figure. He says, remember, you did not see anything when I spoke to you at Mount Horeb, at Mount Sinai. Why? Because he is a most pure spirit. Not carnal, not fleshly, not earthly. And he says, you will corrupt yourselves if you create corrupted representations of me to represent the invisible God. And soon enough, you will not be worshiping me at all but your heart will be led away to worship the things of the creation rather than the creator. And this explains well the present idolatry in the nations. So that is what undergirds the second commandment. It's because God is a spirit. It's rooted in his nature. And so let us remember this as we think of the jealousy of God. In worship, God is not only jealous of the things that he commands us to do, He is also jealous over what he is. He is jealous over his being and that you represent him as he is. And this should give us a holy awe for God. 
to remember that he is jealous over what he is, not just the ordinances of worship which lead us to him. Could you imagine, just thinking about the bare reading of the second commandment, creating representations of one who defies representation and then thinking such a glorious and majestic God would be pleased with that? No. That answer is rooted and grounded in God's essence, in his nature as most pure spirit. Paul preached at Mars Hill, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's device. There is no room for man's device in the worship of God, because then we would start to create a representation of him. God is a spirit. Now we must know this of God, and Jesus alludes to it here. We must know what he is and what he is not. Remember in verse 22, and I don't think we, we stop to think of what Jesus says here very much. He tells the Samaritan woman who thought she worshipped Jehovah this, ye worship ye know not what. Ye worship what ye know not what. We know what we worship. Let's remember those words, beloved, and fear. Ye worship what ye know not what. What would it be like to hear those words from the Savior? And this is the Savior saying them. But instead, let's take the word of God, know God, and say, we know what we worship. We know who he is in his glory as it is revealed to us. We know he is a most pure spirit, not like us, not like angels, not like anything else. Children, I especially bring this to you to show you he is worthy of your worship. Psalm 18.3 says, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. The more you think of who God is of a truth, the more that that resonates with your soul. This one, and this one only, is worthy of worship. And that's what, if you don't know children, our word worship in English is derived from. It is to ascribe worth. It is to ascribe worth to him. And is not this transcendent God who is so glorious worthy of our worship? And the psalm that concludes the book of praises says, Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Our worship is suited to what God is, excellent and great. And so our hearts must be stirred to consider him with all of his dignity, all of his excellency. And our worship is dignified, and it is orderly, and it is excellent because he is, and worthy of it. We even think of the profound joy that we come into when we come into the worship of God. Why is that? Again, it reflects something of who he is. We worship ever-blessed God the one who is eternally blessed. So worship, Jesus says, is fundamentally rooted in the nature of God. You miss that, you miss everything. Or your orthodox principles are unmoored from where they ought to be moored. And worship, even in all our orthodoxy, can miss the plot, which is how great and awesome God is. Now, as for the RPW, that principle that says God must reveal how he is to be worshipped, that very idea itself I want to press on you is rooted in the very nature of God. And this is why I said we can unmoor the principles of worship from the nature of God. Why is it that the RPW is based in the very nature of God? Because only God knows himself. And he is incomprehensible. Psalm 145, verse 3 says, In connection to praise, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. 1 Corinthians 2, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. And think on this, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So the RPW, which says that we must worship God as he has commanded, flows out of the very nature of God, 
that unless God revealed these things to us by his spirit, we would have no way, no clue of how to worship God, which is why you look around this world and even in too much of the Christian church and you see people who do not know how to worship God. They would be worshiping with golden rats and tumors. So, even the very basis of the principle of worship is found in Jesus saying God is a spirit. And when you speak of the doctrine of worship to others, beloved, don't neglect that. That we endeavor to worship God as he is, not as what we would like him to be, which is often far too fleshly. And that leads us to our second head, sacrifice is spiritual. So having considered the nature of God, let's consider ourselves. Jesus teaches that we must be aligned in worship to the very nature of God. Verse 24 says, those that worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. We are not like God, that is true. Yet we are made in his image, and we are most like him in our spirit, that is, in our soul. Divinity, as you know, has no body parts. But our spirit, though not a most pure spirit, uh, like God is, our spirit is most close and nearest to his own nature. So to worship in spirit is to have our souls worship him under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We seek to have our soul worship God under the influence of the Holy Spirit, who is God himself. Philippians 3.3, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The worship of God is a matter of the soul more than that of the body. Now our body expresses what is in the soul, but our worship is rooted in the soul. It's not rooted in outward senses, It's not rooted in outward motions, but it is rooted in inward parts and inward motions. Heaven, before the general resurrection, proves the truth that worship must be spiritual and not carnal. Have you ever thought on Hebrews 12.23 that we often cite that says, But ye are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, which we know God is a spirit, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. And to the spirits of just men made perfect. Now what do an innumerable company of angels, God the judge of all, and to the spirits of these men made perfect have in common? They are spirits. Heaven is a spiritual place. They have no need for bodies or anything carnal to worship God perfectly. After the general resurrection, yes, we will have our bodies there, and Jesus has his body there now. But the worship of God will still be principally a spiritual matter for the soul. Does our body not matter in worship? You might ask the question. It absolutely does. But our bodies, as I have said, follows what is in our spirit. We bow our heads. Why? Because we bow our hearts first before the majesty most high. We opened our mouth to praise, but it is out of the heart that the mouth speaks. You see the principles and the practices follow. Consider then the faculties of the soul then. In the worship of God, mark it well. This is what matters. These are the parts that must be engaged. The mind, the will, the affections brought under the influence of the spirit of God in worship. The greatest commandment, Jesus says, summarizes the law of God. And the second commandment is under it. You are to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. In worship, principally. The Lord wants your hearts and minds engaged. He wants your mind engaged in worship. He wants your heart's affections. He wants your will purposing in this time, in this hour, I will behold the beauty of the Lord and nothing, not my flesh, will come in its way. And as the body is engaged, it is engaged because it is moved by our soul. 
right? In praise, the raising of the soul to God comes first before the raising of the voice. Such that if you were completely mute, unable to open your mouth to praise God, yet the Lord finds what is in your heart, that heart praise, pleasing. What if your eyes were completely blinded and you could not see the minister, you could not read your Bible? Is it not the heart's reception of the word of God that matters? The Lord is looking for the posture of your soul in worship. As you heard in the Q&A on the posture of prayer, these things of the body are not unimportant. They reflect the decorum and orderliness of worship and are prescribed as well. But the soul, the spirit of man under the influence of the Holy Spirit is what God is after. That is why I often in my congregation, I say, stand if able. But are your prayers not heard if you're not standing because of a bodily infirmity? No. But if you or I come into the house of God cold, unfeeling, unwilling to praise him no matter what has transpired the last six days, if we moan and groan inwardly, though outwardly we're smiling to everyone and even the minister, we're not worshiping in spirit, are we? When we come to worship, we come ready to offer our soul to God. He wants desire in us for him, and he wants desire in us to worship him. That we would, by the Holy Spirit working in the ordinances of God, give glory to him, ascribe his worth. Without your heart in the worship of God, and you know, several come to our churches because they say, yes, you get worship right. And we do believe, out of the word of God we do, but they sort of rest in that. They just come thinking, here is a psalm singing church with no musical accompaniment. You'll hear a minister preach a very edifying sermon. There'll be prayer, and the Lord's sacrament will be observed, and as I believe it ought to be, with much preparation and so on. I've arrived, and yet their heart is nowhere near God. That's a huge problem. You think that isn't sacrifice pleasing to God? What does God care for that? That is folly, friends. It has always been the sacrifice of the heart that he wants. It's your spirit, it's soul that he wants. Formalism and lukewarmness in worship are meant to be eradicated by this text just as much as false expressions of worship. 1 Peter 2.5 speaks of the kind of sacrifice we offer up in worship. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. Why? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Now we could say much about our mediator making our sacrifice acceptable to God. It's the only way. We don't offer up Let's come back to 1 Peter for a moment, though. We don't offer up bodily sacrifices, bulls or goats, but spiritual ones are souls made acceptable to God by the mediation of Jesus Christ. But note the order if you are listening. We offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Charnock rightly observes, the sacrifice is first spiritual before it be acceptable to God in Jesus Christ. If the sacrifice is not spiritual, it cannot be made acceptable to God in Christ. There has to be an engagement with the ordinances by our soul. So faith is necessary to engage in the worship of God. We must know what God is, that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him in worship. So that is worshiping in spirit, but it is also worship in truth, and that is spiritual too. It is worship that is rooted in the truth of God's word. The revelation of who he is and what pleases him. Jesus said, you children, you know this well in his prayer, thy word is truth. That is what regulates our soul's affections. That is what orders our mind aright. That is what purposes our will and says my will is set on right things. It is because of the truth of God's word. 
you know our soul can have disordered affections. And that's why many who say, well, I just feel like my spirit is engaged and I can do whatever I want in worship and God finds that pleasing. That's a ditch on the other side, isn't it? You know, before Christians started falling prey to postmodernism, saying to everything, what is truth in culture, we fell prey to it in worship. We said, I must worship the way that my flesh feels gratified in worship. Now we worship according to God's being and the truth of the revelation of God. That is most certainly where the regulative principle of worship is necessary for us. So let's summarize what spirit and truth are as time is going, getting away from us. We are to know what God is and we are to worship God with the faculty that is most like God. Our souls brought under the Holy Spirit's influence that makes worship spiritual. And we do so regulated by God's revelation of himself using his word. And Jesus Christ says we must worship God this way. I think we best take it seriously when the mediator of worship says it. Some hand wave the principles of worship away completely saying, well, Christ will make my worship acceptable whatever I do. But here the mediator himself says, he demands that you worship in spirit and in truth. That also means, I want to dwell on this because we can't get past it, in order to worship God acceptably, you must be converted. You must be converted. You must be filled with the Holy Spirit to worship God. Your heart must be alive to God, regenerated. You must be in Christ, in the mediator, to worship God because you offer worship unto God made acceptable by him. And so if you think that you can worship God or you are in some way doing something when you come into church, sitting there in the seat, uh, opening up the psalm book, listening to the sermon, but you are not in Christ and you think in some way God is pleased with that, he is not. He is not. Maybe in a conference like this you think that's obvious and needs not saying, but it needs saying because there are many who believe that because they have placed their rump on a pew every Sunday of their life, that God owes them heaven. There are those who were once little old ladies, sweet as can be outwardly, that went to church 52 times a year, singing God's praise, hearing sermons, and are burning in hell right now. Because they were not born again. And they never turned to the Savior in repentance and faith. And all of that worship, as our brother preached, was just impenitence in a way. As the minister preaches, you must turn to the Lord. They feel like, no, my worship and my so-called good life is going to open the gates of heaven. And they have found that it opened the pit of hell for them instead. So remember our brothers preaching last night. Turn to Christ if you have deluded yourself into thinking just because you are here or you go to church, then all is well between you and the Almighty. Have your confidence in Christ, no confidence in you. Well, with those two principles, we worship according to the nature of God and we worship as spiritual people according to the truth of God's word. We come to our last heading Worship is simple, and this all flows. Now, because worship is spiritual in accordance with the nature of God, New Testament worship in the gospel era is extraordinarily simple, extraordinarily simple, and only um, uh, all the forms and the, the shadows that were uh, leading us to Christ are blown away because Christ, the substance of the new covenant, is here in clarity, and there are simple elements in our worship that gives faith plain sight of the mediator. And as Reverend Beers said as uh, he introduced this time to us, right, it requires one to be spiritual under the influence of the Holy Spirit to perceive it. 
those who think that they are being very spiritual with their cluttered and complex worship services that have nothing to do with the ordinances that God has prescribed, which man's flesh might say is boring, they're not worshiping God in spirit and in truth. They're devising a God of their own nature. But these simple ordinances, which require, as you heard in the last heading, faith to engage in, they give the soul, the mind's eye, a glorious picture of God. And it causes us to bow down more deeply before him, to have praises more profound that are uttered as we sing such praises as against thee and only thee have I sinned, O God. And I come into the, heart, uh, into the house of God with a broken and a contrite spirit and I praise God with the understanding of my soul that as I praise God in that way, he says, this is the sacrifice that is pleasing to me. Not bouncing up and down, jumping around, putting the smoke machine on, turning up the incense, putting the bells here and there and the candles and everything else. It takes a spiritual man or woman or child under the influence of the Holy Ghost to offer that up as worship instead. And we praise God for such clarity and power in the worship of God. Oh, you're not going to impress the world with this form of worship. You're not. But the unbeliever who comes here and is one of God's own people, when he comes under the influence of the Holy Ghost, he comes and he falls on his face and says, God is among these people of a truth. So yes, you're not going to influence men and win friends through the worship of God as prescribed by God, but you will find the spiritual man or woman has such a savor in a place like this, feels, has the savor of God in such a place like this. And it's glorious. So the soul takes the ordinances under the influence of the Spirit and beholds the beauty of the Lord. And the simplicity of New Testament worship again follows from the being of God. God is simple. That doesn't mean he's simplistic or anything. He is undivided without parts and, and so on. But the beauty of the simplicity of God, God is a most pure spirit, drives the simplicity of worship. That is to his majesty and glory. But you might wonder, what then about the Old Testament and all its ceremonies, its incense and altars and animals? Did God change his mind? Did he say, I didn't want spiritual worship then, and now I do? Because the worship of the Old Testament can seem earthly and carnal. I don't have time to treat that as well. But God wanted spiritual worship in the Old Testament. Does Psalm 51 not proclaim that? The broken and contrite heart, as we well know. The substance of the Old Testament is spiritual. Even when it came to circumcision, what did God say? Circumcise your heart. Calvin summarized it this way. In all ages, God wished to be worshipped by faith prayer, thanksgiving, purity of heart, and innocence of life. And at no time did he delight in any other sacrifices. But under the law, there were various additions so that the spirit and truth were concealed under forms and shadows. Whereas now that the veil of the temple has been rent, nothing is hidden or obscured. Now Christ is alluding to that in our discourse in John 4, that the time of forms and shadows is over, but the time has come now that we will all worship in spirit and truth throughout the world, wherever, no need to come to Jerusalem. And so, I want you to consider with me the simplicity of the ordinary elements of worship for just a moment. I don't have time to treat them all, but you can despise them. And they're not to be despised, but they are to be uh, greatly appreciated and God is to be praised to have them. Think of the ordinary elements of worship. Prayer, psalm singing, reading the word, preaching the word, the sacraments. All very simple, aren't they? And they're very spiritual. Do not despise that. Do not despise that. For these ordinances, all of them are rooted in and based on the word of God. Aren't they? All of them. You have already heard that the word is the revelation of the incomprehensible God. It is a spiritual word 
for spiritual people to engage in spiritual worship. John 6, 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. The Bible, the very word of God, is the central piece in the worship of God. It is the central piece in the worship of God. Okay, Jesus says, we must worship in spirit and truth. Have you ever thought on how that relates to the very word of God itself? These words, he says in John 6, they are spirit. These words, he says in John 17, they are truth. Thy word is truth. So here is spirit and here is truth for us to worship God. These meet in the word. And that's why the elements of our worship, all of them revolve around the word of God. It's often a joy, isn't it, to take our bulletin to one who's come into a church like ours and say, look, it's all the word of God. It's the word, it's the word, it's the word, it's the word. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And to the spiritual person, there have been many who've come into our churches. I can speak from experience. They had no initial desire to worship God the way that we do. But because they adore the voice of the Savior, they adore the word of God, they stick in our churches because this is what they want. They want the word of God. And it is the word that brings life to us. So, of course, we respond. Think of the elements of worship revolving around the word of God. The Psalms are the word of Christ dwelling in us in our soul. Colossians 3.16 reminds that. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Our prayers are according to the will of God. 1 John 5.14. This is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Where do you find his will, children? The word of God. I'm always blessed by the ministers here who are praying, and the word just comes out in the prayers. They come out, it comes out, because they are praying according to the will of God. The preaching of the word, the reading of the word ought to be obvious. So I won't belabor the point. The sacraments, you likely know, are the word made visible. Nonsense to us. If the word preached did not give meaning to them, points our faith to the waters that represent the cleansing of our sins, but the word must proclaim that. To point our faith to the body and blood of Christ and the death of the testator, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. It's the word. And the sacrament, does it minister to your body or does it minister to your spirit? Larger Catechism, question 168. They that worthily communicate feed upon his body and blood to their spiritual nourishment. Very simple elements, aren't they? All grounded in the very word of God, the revelation of God himself. That makes it very easy to evaluate, in a sense, the worship of the churches of God. When ceremonies are added, smells and bells like Rome, images and icons, bands, smoke machines, skits and plays, worship becoming carnal, gratifying the flesh, it's a corruption of the spirituality and simplicity of the worship of God. It's not rooted in God himself. And when we diverge from simplicity and spirituality, we are turning away from God. And that's what we need to know in the worship of God. We are turning away from the object that we profess to worship. And we hear Jesus then say to us, we know not what we worship. As he chided the Samaritan woman. That is why there is a correlation between churches that have a very high liturgy, as they would call it, that obscures the spirituality of worship with carnal means. There's a high correlation with those churches and those that create images and icons of persons of the Godhead. These are all linked together. And they corrupt themselves as we read in Deuteronomy 4. And soon they have departed entirely from God himself. Pastor Matul said something profound. I jotted down from his sermon on Psalm 27. Carnal men embellish the ordinances of God. Carnal men, not spiritual men, carnal men embellish 
the worship, the ordinances of God. So let me just tell you this. If you come to a church, and it might seem very harmless at first, and you see images of God or of Christ, you are in a dangerous place. Very dangerous for the soul. Because Christ said, ye know, uh, you worship what ye know not. So it's not just a light thing. It's a dangerous thing to break the second commandment so overtly. But before they did it so overtly, they have already undermined it in other ways. Now, not many churches, even Reformed churches, would preach the words, ye worship, ye know not what, with any force or application. Many Reformed churches would just leave that as maybe a statement on redemptive history. But we ought to fear. Our church ought to fear when we hear things like that and ought to examine ourselves. So what of our churches then? You see these principles at work in our worship. We are bound to this manner of worship children because it is scriptural. And it is not just our tradition. It's not just because this is Scottish Presbyterianism. This is biblical Christianity. Let us not just say we are Scottish Presbyterians in manner of worship. We are biblical. We are not just... Uh, and it's been wonderful, haven't, hasn't been, that our speaker this year has come from Sri Lanka. The same manner of worship applies to Sri Lanka, China, North America, Antarctica, and every other place on the globe. The same manner of worship. So children, boys and girls, you, we have no interest in maintaining this form of worship as man's tradition. We want you to see that it is spiritual worship and uh, um, rooted in the unchanging God, and so it is fixed. From this study, then, learn the RPW, which teaches us that the God who reveals himself has revealed what pleases him in worship, which is in accord with his nature. And there are also glorious advantages to the simplicity of worship that are suited for the gospel age. (laughs) How wonderful it is that missionaries don't need to drag behind them an organ. They can go to the jungles They can go to every place. They can take their Bible. An ordained man can preach the gospel. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And as souls are converted, let us now worship God. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that to the advantage and to the advancement of the missionary endeavor as well as these things come full circle? It is. Isn't it wonderful that you can go and just gather around together as a family with your psalm book, with the word of God, and worship God in the tents of Jacob? I remember when I was in another church and the doctrine of family worship came up, and I was thinking, am I going to have to learn to play a musical instrument? And how freeing, how liberating it was to learn these principles of worship. And God wants the heart expressed through the mouth. And I can simply sing to the Lord his own praise. Don't need to go on the internet and find some music or anything. Here it is in the very middle of my Bible. And so it'll be the word of God that not only converts, but enables us to worship in spirit and truth. Let's close then with verse 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers, what a wonderful thing it is to think of true worshipers, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. There are true worshipers. There are false worshipers. That ought to sober us up. There are some who worship and there are some not worshiping. You can reflect on the heart matter that we have spoken of um, before. But positively, the Father says he is seeking. He is seeking such to worship him in spirit and in truth. God has expressed his desire to you, hasn't he? Will you be the one to say, here am I, Lord. I desire to worship thee. Here am I, one such as you are seeking. And I will, no matter how hard it is on my flesh, no matter how boring at first my mind thinks it is, or my flesh rather thinks it is, I will give you what you want. 
That is the posture of a worshiper. And as you do so, what a wondrous thing it is that grace transforms your mind and your heart such that now you long for the simplicity of worship and its spirituality. And if you were given a choice to go back to carnal, fleshly worship, you might vomit. But the Father says, he is seeking such as these. May we be such a people unto the glory of God. Amen. Let us arise for prayer, if able. Gracious God of heaven, thou art a most pure spirit. Thou art completely other. And yet thou hast not left us groping in the dark. Thou hast given to us the very word of God to reveal how we may worship thee in spirit and in truth. In our camp, O God, in our tribe, among the tribes of Israel, Perhaps our greatest need is for our souls to be engaged upon the proper ordinances. And so, Father, we pray that thou wouldst enliven us, that when we go into the house of God, we would come with desire for thee. And we would come with desire for the ordinances of God, for they lead us unto thee. Give us thy spirit, for our flesh profiteth not in, the ma in worship, but quicken our hearts, Lord. Give us minds, wills, and affections for thee, that we would ever offer up praise that is acceptable and pleasing unto thee. O oh Lord, how we long for that beatific vision of God, for that day in which thou would call us to thyself if we be in Christ, where we will get to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord for all the days of our life. And what is eternal life but knowing thee and thy son? We bless thee and praise thee for such a word as this. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.